Double secret probation? It made for comedy in the classic movie Animal House, but State Representative Earl Earhart isn't laughing about some current cases at Georgia Tech. He's ready to go to the mat to make sure students get due process instead of having to rely on justice by school administrators. His biggest bargaining chip? University funding. And you say you want a revolution? Governor Deal says he wants to change the world of education in Georgia. What does he mean? And does he have the political capital to make change happen? Lawmaker starts right now. Welcome to Lawmakers, I'm Bill Nygut. It's day 11 of the 2016 session of the Georgia General Assembly, but who's counting? And it was a busy day down at the Gold Dome. Let's get right down to Shelby Lynn, who's got our Capitol Report. Hi, Shelby. At the Capitol today, Bill, opponents of a medical marijuana expansion bill did not get to voice their opposition to Representative Alan Peake's bill after the hearing was canceled. Peak and supporters are still working out some of the details in the measure, even at Monday's hearing where those in favor of the bill got to tell legislators why. The chairman of the House Judiciary Non-Civil Committee made it clear that lawmakers were still tweaking a final version of the legislation. For the purpose of this bill, 722, I uh, wanted to let you know that um, the actual legislation is being uh, reworked. Um, as a result, today we're not going to uh, be hearing specific portions of the bill or a substance of the bill, we're going to have a separate hearing later on when we uh, get the substitute ready to be introduced. Representative Rich Golick is chairing the committee and explained on Monday that he expects plenty of opportunities for both supporters and opponents of the bill to voice their opinions before a final vote. At once the uh, committee sub is introduced, I am confident that we are going to have um, a full vetting of the legislation. This new plan includes allowing marijuana cultivation in Georgia, something currently illegal under state law, even though lawmakers legalized the use of cannabis oil last year for treatment of certain illnesses. But we knew when we passed legislation last year that there were still going to be one big, huge barrier. How do you access the product? We allowed protection from prosecution for possession for citizens that were properly registered with the state, but we didn't provide a mechanism of how could they get a safe, lab-tested, effective product here in Georgia. Peak's expanded marijuana bill also includes a provision to increase the number of illnesses for cannabis oil treatment from 8 to 17. But Governor Nathan Deal, among others, is not on board with the expansion bill. There's also concern in the law enforcement community over it. But more than 500 Georgians have already registered with the state to legally use cannabis oil. They just don't have a means of legally obtaining the medication in Georgia. We'll continue following this story and bring you the latest developments when they occur. Members of both the House and the Senate attended the annual State of the Judiciary Address today from Supreme Court Chief Justice Hugh Thompson. He told legislators about his vision for a 21st century court system in Georgia. Now, we are no longer living in a 1950s Georgia. The courts of the 21st century must be equipped to handle an increasingly diverse population. Living today in metropolitan Atlanta alone are more than 700,000 people who were born outside the United States. According to the Chamber of Commerce, today some 70 countries have a presence in Atlanta in the form of a consulate or trade office. We must be ready to help resolve the disputes of international businesses that are increasingly locating in our state and capital. The Chief Justice says the courts must be accessible to all citizens and armed with modern technology to get information to the people who need it. Now, when I first became a judge, we had no email, no cell phones, no internet. People didn't Twitter or text or post things on YouTube, Facebook or Instagram. Back then, the most modern equipment we had was a mimeograph machine. Does anybody remember what a mimeograph machine was? He says the courts are rapidly moving away from paper documents into the digital age. He also wants to be able to accept more appeals of decisions by the Court of Appeals. These cases are often the most complex and the most consequential. They involve issues of great importance to the legal system and the state as a whole or they involve an area of law 
that has become inconsistent and needs clarification. Businesses and citizens need to know what the law allows them to do and what the law does not allow them to do. It's our job at the highest court to reduce any uncertainty and bring consistency and clarity to the law. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? The Chief Justice says when the Supreme Court issued its ruling on same-sex marriage last year, Georgia judges moved quickly to implement the law, no matter what the Supreme Court's decision. These men are all great leaders who spared our state the turmoil other states endured. The bottom line is this, in Georgia, we may like the law, we may not like the law, but we're going to follow the law. The Chief Justice also says he wants all courts in Georgia staffed with qualified interpreters, and he wants signs and directions at the courts in different languages. That way all court staff have the tools they need to help any customer. The Georgia House is scheduled to vote on the 2016 amended budget proposal tomorrow. The House Appropriations Committee approved the amended budget this morning, and the House Rules Committee put it on tomorrow's calendar. The budget process continues next week when the Appropriations Committee starts working on the 2017 spending plan. Finally tonight, it was school choice day at the state capitol. It's part of a national effort to get students and parents to demand better schools. Hundreds of students and their teachers turned out for a speech from Governor Nathan Deal and the featured speaker, Atlanta rapper Ludacris. The best way to avoid getting in trouble in this state is to stay in school and get an education. The best way to ensure that you're going to move your, your family, yourself, and those around you out of the fringes or in the depths of poverty is to get an education. As a father and as a husband, I know firsthand how important education is. But I realize that not all families have the financial means that my family possesses. And that's why educational choice is so important. Regardless to income, regardless to zip code, regardless to social status, all children should be able to access a great school. The fact that Ludacris was there made it fun and exciting for students, but the musician had a very serious message. He urged families to get involved in their school systems, attend school board meetings, and be prepared to move to communities that have better schools if necessary. That's it from the Capitol tonight, Bill. Back to you. All right, Shelby. Thanks so much. Let's get into our conversation. Joining me tonight, State Representative Earl Earhart, Republican from Powder Springs. Senator Emanuel Jones, he's a Democrat from Decatur? Yes. That's what I, okay, I just want to make sure, because <laughs> your businesses are all uh, down in the south side of town. So. That's correct. All right, I just want to make sure. Christina Torres, who is, of uh, course, political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and covers the legislature every session. Thank you all so much for being with us. Um, Representative Earhart, we're going to start with you. If you don't mind, let me give a little background, and then you certainly pick up from there. Um, so we're going to talk for a while tonight about an episode that has come to uh, Representative Earhart, Earhart's con, um, attention that he's very concerned about. Last summer, an African-American woman alleged that members of a Georgia Tech fraternity shouted racial slurs at her from the fraternity house. The fraternity denied the claim and produced, produced security tape that seemed to refute the story, but Tech put the entire fraternity, 100 members or so, on something called suspension in abeyance. It meant no intramural sports, no socials, and all members had to take sensitivity training. No appeal was allowed to the tech uh, president or the state board of regents or to a court of law. Now my guest, Representative er Earhart, says that was wrong. A couple of other cases that uh, he uh, knows about at tech uh, contributed to his concerns about this so-called suspension in abeyance. And, and Representative Earhart, this is not a problem confined, in your opinion, to Georgia Tech. This is a system-wide uh, issue with this so-called suspension in abeyance, right? That's correct. It's a system. It's a system-wide. It's a statewide. It's a national issue, and it's not necessarily suspension in abeyance. That was just one of Tech's tools. Uh, it is due process. That's, okay, that's the issue. Thanks for the correction. Clearly, due process, and that is really not a correction because that's that's what started this was that suspension in abeyance. The idea. I mean, it, it truly was double secret appropriation from right out of Animal House, where you just 
it was an absurdity. But what we found as we started to dig into this, and uh, you you had the Regents overturning the the recent um, uh, sexual assault claim that one young man made an answer, another young at man tech. at tech. Uh, this, and again, this is not about tech. This is about, yeah, we, we, yeah. we began to dig into this and we found, shockingly, and I found nationwide that there's a, there's a, there's a major problem here. That, uh, you have disparate parties all over the political spectrum that are having a major problem with this. And this began with the Title IX issues. And, it, and it, it, what has happened is these campuses are taking the single investigator model uh, with no standard of proof other than a coin flip, which is what uh, it pretty much is, and they're they're applying no due process protection to the accused. In other words, an accusation is a conviction in 100% of the cases at Tech, and I'm not talking about the cheating scandals or the running in the hall or the chewing gum. That's 95% of the cases. Those are non-contested. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about where somebody is branded with a scarlet letter of either a racist, like in the fraternity, or more particularly the criminal action of being a sexual assaulter or a sexual intimidator, which are two of those cases. And the problem is the Regents' own report just came out three weeks ago that said that Tech was providing almost no due process in any case. We're going to lose these cases. You had uh, uh, tech president uh, Bud Peterson was at the hearing. Uh, we should at least listen to what he said mm -hmm. publicly about No, this. no problem. I hazard to say that every single criminal act is a violation of our student code of conduct. So what we try to do is not uh, impose any sanctions or judgment or opinion about the criminal aspects of a particular violation, but to focus on the code of conduct and how it uh, impacts and does or does not violate that. Well, Christina, you want to jump in here? Well, a quick question, and I'm playing devil's advocate, so I acknowledge that. But what do you say to the sexual assault victim who you, may be too fearful to come forward to begin with? You say that she has every right not to come forward, but in this country, both the accused and accuser have basic rights. Due process is a, is a basic constitutional right, so no matter whether you're on a college campus or not. I, I say protect the accuser. The court systems train jurists, train police officers. We've done it for, for child victims. We've done it for rape shield laws, and these are appropriate. They're do but there's no place in this country where you're, an accused is not given the ability to present evidence in their defense. S Senator, I, and, and, and that's what happens at Tech. That, and, and that's what the facts found. No evidence, no hearing, in, in, a, in a sense. All the exculpatory evidence was completely thrown out the door. Let me get you in here, yeah. Senator. Well, I'm glad to hear that uh, my good friend is talking about due process because it's not just at the collegiate level. Uh, I've done a lot of work. I did a lot of hearings on due process at the uh, elementary, the middle school, and certainly at the high school level. Mm -hmm. And what I see in a lot of those cases, starting early on in the child's academic career, is that you normally have one person that's paid by the administration that passes judgment on all these cases where kids commit these minor infractions. So we're going to talk about due process. Let's not just limit it to the colleges and universities mm -hmm. in our system. Let's go back and talk about due process for all kids. What's the solution? What are you looking for? What I'm looking for is for the colleges and the regents system, to their credit, is going to, in the next couple of weeks, maybe even sooner, place clear mandates on every college in this system that provide the basic due process rights of right to counsel, right to cross-examine, right to a standard of proof, right to transparency, right to the Fifth Amendment, right for not uh, remain silent and not put yourself at, at risk. Christina, but you're expressing a concern now that you worry on a college campus, or you're at least asking a question about... And, and asking a question. Yeah. I think it, it's fair to know, and we know this nationally as well as locally, that there are victims of assault who are fearful to come forward because they don't want to be labeled um, as anything. They may not trust the official process. And, and I'm not but, saying... No, you're and I guess the, the, only, boy, the only response is, can you convict somebody and ruin their life? Like two of these young men, there's two cases right now that... And I, and I read two of those letters during it. These two young men, without any due process, the, the, uh, had been labeled can't get a job, can't get back in school. This one young man was at 3-9 in mechanical engineering, had never had anything wrong, and it was based on purely an allegation. This individual, Mr. Peter Paquette at Tech, looked at no evidence. You him. actually, in your, te in your uh, hearing, had testimony from a mother who was in tears because oh. of the fact that she felt, as you do, that her son was not given due process, kicked out of the university, readmitted but feels he's been yeah. scarred well, that by one this. and the other mom that's that 
that flew back as a cancer patient from Baltimore, John Hopkins, and was dying, and Peter Paquette laughed at her and wouldn't let her in the room. Wait, let me let me throw child. out. We've got to go this to a break. This is an evil man. We, we've got to go to a break. But let me throw out something here. Is is if you're if you are finding a problem that, that, that's mm. real, is part Parenting. of this a university's overreactions and concerns? University administrators now are so under pressure to do the right thing. Some of it's political correctness. Some this is beyond law. But yeah, is that is that part of what happens here? It's a reaction to, in a bit large part, to the dear colleague letter that was sent from the Department of Education uh, about four years ago. The problem with dear colleague letters, it's not federal law. It's not a statute. It's not even a regulation, which preempts because it did not go through the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, Again, disparate parties from Janet Napolitano to Harvard's Janet Haley to um, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson there, and many U.S. senators are now saying this is a train wreck. This is taking and throwing out due process protections that have been around in our country for hundreds right. of years. I, I got to take a break. <laughs> um, and we are going to watch this uh, uh, go forward. We got a lot more we want to talk about. I want to talk about some of your legislation. You want to talk. We got guns to talk about lots, tonight. Lots so uh, let's do guns, this. Right. Um, <laughs> Today, though, the Senate passed the first piece of legislation, their first piece of legislation for the session. Um, Christina was there. It was uh, Senator Marty Harbin's first bill on the floor. There's sort of a rite of passage for a freshman lawmaker to be bombarded with silly questions when he or she presents their first bill. <laughs> Senator Harbin skated by because of time constraints. Take a listen. Isn't it true this is actually not only just the first a uh, bill of the session, but it's your first bill of being in the in the well. The senator is very observant, and you are correct, sir. I just wanted to make sure we call that to everyone's attention. <laughs> well, we're going to give him a, we're going to give him a pass today because uh, we got the we've got the the judiciary, the state of the judiciary, that's uh, waiting. So please be advised that uh, the senator, even though this is his first, he, he's going to he's going to get uh, hit hard on this on another bill. What a killjoy. <laughs> Coming up on Lawmakers, Governor Dill says he doesn't want to reform education. He's going to revolutionize it. But what does he mean? As he, and is he in a position to make it happen? We'll talk about that during our second segment. But first, how well do you know your lawmaker? Representative Brian Strickland is a Republican from McDonough. He represents House District 111. Strickland's been in the General Assembly since 2013. He's an attorney, and he happens to be a direct descendant of one of the original founders of Henry County. He loves to play guitar and names Garth Brooks as his favorite country artist. Strickland also tells us he prefers the old Taylor Swift songs rather than the newer pop versions. P.S. He has two cats. More Lawmakers in a minute. Wednesday at 7.30 on GPB. Home again at last. Heavens, we are quite a party. <laughs> Blood is not gray or blue, it's all one color. Which side are you on? We stand on the eve of a black revolution. Your family story was true. That is crazy talk. I love it. Well done, my lord. Yes, well done us. I can hardly believe it. The 2016 Downton Abbey Sweepstakes is going on now. Enter and you could win the grand prize. A six-day, five-night trip for two to Great Britain. Tour select Masterpiece Series film locations, Highclere Castle, and Poldark film sites in Cornwall. The grand prize also includes a decorative copper kettle prop from Mrs. Patmore's Kitchen. You could also win one of four monthly prizes of Downton Abbey merchandise from Shop PBS. Enter daily through March 15, 2016, and read official rules at pbs.org slash sweepstakes. Did you know that although Governor Deal went through a hard time with the Great Recession, he didn't have it as bad as Governor Eugene Talmadge did during the Great Depression? 
On this date in 1933, Talmadge announced he was cutting more than $2 million from the state budget. As Talmadge put it, the expenditures went to the bone. $2 million in 1933 would be roughly the equivalent of $36 million of today's dollars. Welcome back to Lawmakers. With me tonight, Representative Earl Earhart, Senator Emanuel Jones, and the AJC's Christina Torres. Uh, Senator, you talked a little while ago about some of your concerns about due process in lower yes. uh, level education, high schools, and that sort of thing. But you have a bill this session that's kind of a companion piece to something you did last year. You've been very concerned about continuing education for a very specific part of our student population. Talk about that. Absolutely. Last year, I passed into Bill 164 that created the PBIS legislation. What is that? What do those initials stand for? <laughs> PBIS is Positive Behavior Intervention and Support. It's a program, national program. It's been adopted here in Georgia. We saw it as well over 300 schools and well over 70 systems in the state of Georgia. The numbers have just skyrocketed once this legislation was passed. We believe and we strongly believe that systems can change their climate and culture from within, given the proper tools to work with. And that's what this legislation is. Who are the students that you tar are, are part of this whole process? Are these kids who would normally end up in an alternative school? Are they disciplinary problems? Are they kids who uh, uh, carry on in some mm -hmm. uh, uh, inappropriate way? Well, the, the whole thrust of the legislation is trying to identify those schools that have behavior problems, that have high suspension rates, that have high absenteeism, and it's designed to intervene early in the careers of those students and in those particular mm -hmm. systems to try and identify what the causal issues are. So it's designed to address those concerns early on in a tiered approach so that um, we can reduce the absenteeism, the fallout, the dropout rate, and all those other. Is there a fiscal note high. attached to this? Does this cost the state money to institute these changes? It, it does. What it, it, it costs, we put about $250,000 in the budget last year, which is nothing, nothing compared to okay. the $23 billion <laughs> budget that we currently have. And this year, um, the cost that we're asking for in the budget is about $500,000, and that number has come from DOE. Okay. All right. Um, we'll, we'll watch how that develops. Christina, you're talking about gun legislation. Uh, is Suddenly, we knew it was going to happen. It's now popped up, right? It popped up today in the House. Rick Jaspers filed a bill that would allow campus carry, talking about colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see what happens. A lot of the Democrats have filed gun control measures. Yeah, we know Keisha Waits, of course, has a gun Mary safety Margaret, measure. Mary Margaret, Margaret Oliver, Oliver, an even more aggressive bill to ban assault weapons. Gun confiscation right? measures. She said, used the word, didn't she not? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Where Where is campus carry going to go? That's an interesting, uh, you know, we dealt with campus carry, what, two years ago now. And it, it went all the way to the last minute in the House and in the Senate. I think it went mm -hmm. through both houses and then it, it got caught up in a, in a last moment yeah. thing. Yeah, that was 40th there, day. The yeah, problem it was, wasn't it? It was a 40-day it, it issue. Day yeah. issue but, but again, it, I don't, it would not have passed had that been in there. I think it's fair to say that. I, I think, it, yeah, I think it would be. I mean, it was close. I mean, I, I agree with you. It would not have passed. Uh, the, there was uh, the, the regents and, and many of the presidents had uh, made very clear that they weren't in support of that. There were a lot of people that uh, uh, felt very strongly on the other side of the equation. Is this a partisan a, issue or not? It is a partisan issue. We have very broad laws in the state of Georgia in terms of carrying weapons. Why carry them on a college campus? We're talking about the beginning of the segment where we started talking about assaults. We really don't want to put weapons in the kids, in the hands of kids on these college campuses. No more than we have to. And, uh, and certainly the, uh, the college campuses that I visited, you can't travel too far without seeing security. Yeah, well, so we knew it was going to happen. Everything. I mean, we knew it was coming. Well, and, and the funny thing <laughs> is come you, every year. A bunch I mean, of, right, a bunch of bills every year come around. They do a bunch of different things. I find it interesting in the House, Buzz Brockway uh, has also proposed not guns, but he, what he views as a compromise and allowing like stun guns or, or mace to be carried yeah. rather than a gun. Um, let, let's talk uh, a little bit about Governor Deal, who is now saying he wants to revolutionize education in Georgia. Um, what's interesting about this is that, um, Christina, we've seen a governor who for th last three sessions that I can think of has talked about all these reforms that he believes. And I don't doubt for a second he's sincere, um, you know, re, re, uh, t tinkering with changing the, right. the quality basic education funding formula. He now wanted merit pay for teachers. teachers right. And yet he keeps pulling back 
I think, out of election concerns. Well, right? it's a very tough issue. It has been mm -hmm. for decades. Uh, you know, I mean, we have proposals left and right. Last year, I believe it was last year, you got the Opportunity School District uh, proposal mm -hmm. passed, Move which on, took a ready. lot of effort to do. Um, does he want to take on the teachers again? I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know quite what he means by a revolution. Well, that's that's part of the question that I was going to ask. He just gave him a very big raise, too. Uh, in, this, in this budget, is the recommendation is for a 3% raise. This governor is a, I, I would well, that say he's... that is not a raise. What they've done is put it in block grant money back to the system so the systems get to decide who gets the raise. And last year... Well, they, they won't. They like that. local control. Last he's year taking they them at that, their that, word. They uh, use that, that money that, to... That's, to that's how it's always been done. That's how Zell did it. That's how everybody else has always done it. From Zell to going back to the Harris administration. Yeah. The raises are always passed along to the locals. Again, right. the they want their local control, and they you can, they can the choose not to do it. Jump in here. They're also going to raise health premiums, are they not? Yes. Which not would not cost, teachers. And I, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but it mm -hmm. goes to the districts who are likely to pass on a cost to the teachers whether they get it. Right. There's an, well, again, yeah. an, well, there is an increased burden on the local systems, right? The local systems are, are getting a significant uh, increase in state funds in order to pay teachers more. Okay. If they choose to make decisions to hire more administrators or, or other things that they find as a priority and don't spend that money on health premiums or they don't spend that money on teacher enrichment in their own systems with their own tax money, they have a. They, if, if they decide to tax their, their citizens only uh, at the state minimum millage while the, some of the bigger systems like the Cab and Cobb tax all the way up to the top and have made a true commitment, then that's, that's the difference. All right, let me, before we, because we're really running out of time, uh, let me start with you. Uh, so uh, the other day, Alan Peake admitted to the Atlanta Constitution's Jim Galloway that he has helped at least one family obtain cannabis oil in violation of federal law, it had to be brought in from another state. Uh, the governor uh, made a pretty uh, uh, interesting remark about that uh, yesterday. He said, for those, and, and Peake said civil disobedience is what we need here. And the governor said, well, if you talk about civil disobedience, you better be ready to pay the price for breaking the law. Mm -hmm. That's a shot across Alan Peake's bow. Um, are, do you think we're going to start seeing people bringing in cannabis oil and possibly facing trial because they're violating the law? Well, it certainly might help that we decriminalize not just the cannabis oil, but also cannabis, period. And there will probably be cases where that's the case because we passed the legislation last year authorizing the use of cannabis oil in Georgia. And we got to do something legally, and I hope we do it this session so that we can find a mechanism to deliver the cannabis that's With required. 30 seconds left, are we going to see some move that's going to help these families? Are we going to eventually see limited production here? Eventually, maybe. This year? I don't know. You, don't, you think? Is, is <laughs> I think eventually. I mean, Alan's passionate about this. I think he's willing to take whatever consequence. And I think it's for those those children that need this and the and what we've seen, that, that how that helps these children. I think most legislators would take those consequences. How do you feel? you got 10 seconds about this additional list of diseases, conditions that he wants to add. Is that a slippery I think if slope? They, I do not think so. I think it, it, you can make clear distinctions in those diseases. And I think if they help those kids, I'm all for it. All right. That's the last Absolutely. word. <laughs> you were great. All right. Thank you all so much. Look, we're going to take a listen for a minute, though. Uh, we talked about Keisha Waits a minute ago. Well, she is supporting a measure that aims to protect rape victims who become pregnant as a result of assault. She took to the well this morning to urge support. Let's listen. In 2013, I was contacted by Jane, a survivor of rape, who expressed sentiments of frustration that Georgia did not have laws that protected individuals who conceived a child in the midst of rape. So for that reason, I drafted House Bill 397 to end the torment, torment and turmoil of individuals who had experienced these horrible things. While my bill did not receive traction, as I and dozens of survivors had hoped, I am encouraged that we have another opportunity to support Representative Rassenberger's bill. Work for that was today. Representative uh, Keisha Waits in the well of the uh, House today. So that's it. We uh, have to say goodnight to uh, Manuel Jones, to Earl Earhart, Christina Torres. That does it for day 11 of the 2016 session. 29 legislative days to go. We'll be back tomorrow night for day 12 coverage, including an update on ongoing attempts to get 
some religious freedom bill on the books this year. Another proposal has been made, even as the Indiana business community claims it's lost millions of dollars of convention business. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. I want to remind you that Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, Political Rewind will be on Georgia Public Broadcasting Radio. And at that point, it'll be just three days to the Iowa caucus. You really don't want to miss our conversation on Friday at 3. And uh, we'll be back with more of Lawmakers. Good night.